Okay, hey, and welcome to the SQL Pass Book Readers. We're going to start our session today. Remember, this is our first session talking about learning business intelligence with SQL Server 2012. We're reading Brian Larson's book, and it's available on Amazon. It's pretty affordable, so you're welcome to read along with us. We're reading about 100 pages a month. And so the first reading that we have is part one of this book. And if you can see my screen, you're looking at the contents up right now. So part one is just an introduction to business intelligence and the tools that are available to us to create um, different BI uh, components. So we're going to cover that um, today. In case you're wondering, we're going to do part two next month in August. So this month we're doing chapters one through five. That's about 100 pages. And then part two is about just over 100 pages. And we're going to do chapter six all the way to seven and eight where we'll actually build data marts and reports. Um, my name is Ike Ellis. I'm a SQL Server MVP and have been a BI and SQL consultant for a while now. Uh, I'll be at SQL Pass, so if any of you guys are going to be at SQL Pass, I'm looking forward to seeing you. And with me are Brad Cunningham, Rob Sullivan, and Scott Reed. Um, Brad is a C-sharp MVP. He's been an MVP for about the last four or five years. Say hello, Brad, so they know your voice. Hello, Brad. Brad. I am. I was muted. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Thanks. And then we have Rob Sullivan, who's a popular tweeter and speaker. He just got back from speaking at the NDC, um, the Norwegian Developers Conference, and uh, gave a great talk on SQL Server there, although not super positive. Hey, Rob. <laughs> Hello, Brad. <laughs> and then we have Scott Reed, who's an Azure MVP, and uh, he is reading along with us. So, Scott, you there? Yep, I'm here. Hello. Everyone. Okay, great. So, um, first off, this, these first hundred pages are just basically a quick introduction. Uh, what did you guys think of it? Did you think it was an easy read? I thought it was a pretty easy read until uh, chapter three and chapter four when it started getting into the terminology and some of the concepts. For me, so is a. For me as a developer, I thought it was, you know, high level stuff, but it was a lot of, a lot of buzzwords, a lot yeah. of kind of background info. There wasn't a lot of meat to it, really. A lot of yeah. vocabulary, right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. It was just getting your, you know, getting the ground rules in place, like defining some terms that he's going to use throughout the book. There were some like interesting parts where he dived a little too deep, I thought, in a couple of places, but, um, you know, like. Too much information really at this stage, but uh, for the most part, yeah, it was just high level. So that's interesting. Like I, the vocabulary words, I was already familiar with, so I was kind of able to skim some of it. Um, what vocabulary words did you see where you're like, you've never heard that before? You didn't know what that really meant. Uh, snowflake. Oh, I didn't, yeah, I didn't know that. I, I knew Star Schema and I knew you know Data Marty stuff, but Snowflake was a new one to me. Right, so that's uh, chapter three or four when he talks about like the difference between a snowflake and a star dimension. Yeah, yeah. For me, being so wrapped up in the OLTP, the transactional world, trying to wrap my head around dimensions, measures, and fact tables, and how it relates to what I'm used to in the transactional world, was a was a little bit of a stretch for me. Yeah, it's almost like opposite what you're used to, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what that's why we do these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's why. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, you're like you have these rules in the transactional world about normalizing data and don't repeat data and don't um, you know have a lot of data duplication, and then you get into this book and they're like repeat data, denormalize data, have only a couple tables have a lot of data duplication. And you're like, wait a minute. Um, you know, that wasn't, I don't even know what to think about that. I think one of the problems I had is that he, uh, like in chapter three, he starts going on to dimensions and measures and fact tables. And I didn't like really understand why. I didn't, like to me it didn't click until we started doing the, the star schemas and snowflakes and how it all relates, like why you would start changing the terminology. Yeah, well, like Scott, Scott and Brad and I have talked about this in the past. We really feel like when you learn something new, like almost like 60% of what you're learning is just the vocabulary. Mm -hmm. 
like the shared language so that you can get a shared idea across and yeah I think that's what he was doing in this book right is he was like okay let's agree on vocabulary so that when I use these words in the future you can go back and look at what they mean yeah I think that's the problem with any with anything you're learning right like especially in programming technology a lot of terms just get overloaded like you know people will use the same terms to mean three different things and just depends on where you learned it from and then then people get confused uh like so I, i've learned a fair amount about kind of data mart things and star schema and facts and dimensions but i've heard them kind of described differently in different places there was an older sql i think it was a microsoft press book that had like sql data mart introduction and they overloaded some of those terms to mean slightly different things so you know I got the gist of it here, but I, I think it was uh, it was good to define what he meant when he said fact and dimension and star and snowflake and stuff. I think Rob's yeah. point was valid, though. He didn't really do a great, uh, like, why? Why do it this way? I mean, like, I guess it's sort of intuitive, you know, because you're dealing with a ton of data and you're, um, you know, just a large number of rows. And so you know, you know, I guess, to, to denormalize but he didn't really call that out. Yeah, I think that's important too, and I, I found that that's true in BI in general, is that a lot of the books don't tell you why. Like they just say, trust us, we've been doing it for 20 years, this is the way we do it. And if you're gonna do it, do it like we've been doing it for 20 years. You know? And they don't really address what they learned in that 20 years that told them to do it this way. Well, that's kind of interesting. Like in chapter two, he, uh, you know, he starts in phrases that whole discussion, you know, what's the difference between, you know, say analytics and a report and uh, really starting to get you to think like that. And then, uh, which, which I appreciated and liked. And then when it went to terminology soup in chapter three, I, I kind of missed that why on why are we changing the names? Yeah, but yeah, yeah. That, that could also just be the way I'm wired. <laughs> No, no, that's, I think the thing about BI that's different than software development in, in a major way is that in software development, when we create databases, we're creating them for other developers, and we don't care if they understand us or not, right? But in, in BI, we're creating databases and mechanisms for, for users, and the things that we do in BI, they bubble up directly to the user. And so where we're careless about naming a little bit more when we're naming procedures or columns or tables when developers are using it because they're like, well, they can just ask me. In BI, you name those things and you're going to see user tools hitting it directly. And they're not going to call to ask you. They don't even know who you are. So naming becomes like super important. So one thing that I thought was kind of... Um, one thing I thought was interesting, uh, you know, I've read this a bunch and I understand it, but he kind of pointed out on in chapter two on page in the printed book on page 15, um, he talks about data led discovery and he says, discovering new questions and their answers. I thought it was kind of interesting. Like, you know, that's kind of, to me, that's kind of the crux of BI, at least in my exposure to it. Like as a developer, it isn't that you're providing a report for somebody and you know what questions they want to ask. Like in my experience, when I was working with the data mart and star schemas and providing a reporting tool to kind of go through cubes and things like that, it, the real advantage was that they were able to ask questions about the data that they didn't even know they wanted to ask. If that makes sense. Yeah. So I've got that, I've got that screen right up here where he says data led discovery, right. the information we find determines where we want to go next. Right. Which is, you know, that, so BI is like separated into two types of users typically. And one type of user are pretty sharp people who are data analysts who know how to write commands or use complicated analytical tools. And they are really delving into the data to see what they can learn about the company. And then there's a whole other group of people using BI tools that aren't that smart. We'll call them executives. And they use it to look at reports and dashboards and they get the reports sent to their phone and they don't care about learning a language or 
you know, delving deep into the tooling, they're just trying to get the information out so they can make a quick decision. Yeah, um, yeah, I've done some work in the past on a, a data warehouse that was, you know, crunching transactional data from um, uh, like health and human services type data, personnel information. And uh, what we found is that we found interesting questions more than we found interesting answers. So we didn't actually even, a lot of times we didn't even find the answer. We just kind of looked at the data from a 50,000 foot view and we're kind of flying all over the place. And it led to asking more interesting questions that the answers were outside of the data, right? We just went to the client or we went to the, the users and said, hey, we now see this pattern in the data and we had this interesting question to ask you. And that led to some other discovery and it was even outside of the system, but we would have never known that had we not you know, seeing the data sliced in that particular dimension. Yeah. Um, there's a really cool YouTube video that I'll link um, and it's titled, Let My Data Set Change Your Mindset. And it's all about how assumptions that we make that we think are true, but the data doesn't support that idea. And how we really need to kind of base our beliefs on evidence and what we're looking at, not on what we think is true, you know, but what is actually true. Um, it's deep, Ike. Thanks, man. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was, that cool. was interesting is out of the gate, we all pretty much hovered to chapter three that, you know, I think almost had a comment there. Do you have a comment on chapter one or did everyone just glaze over chapter one? Oh, yeah. I liked the quote. Oh, read <laughs> chapter one. I read, thought that was a, you know I like that quote in general, and it was read, very apropos. Read that quote, um, Scott. Uh, it was the it was the Alice in Wonderland. You had it up earlier. Yeah. Um, would you tell me please which way I ought to go from here? Asked Alice. Well, that depends a good deal on where you want to get to, said the cat. I don't much care where, said Alice. Well, then it doesn't matter which way you want to go, said the cat. Yeah. Yeah. Which way you go, I think, yeah. I think that's like a great quote on organizational leadership, right? Like, yeah. if, if you don't have a destination in mind, then these decisions we make every day don't really matter. Right? Yeah. Making decisions, is that a good decision or a bad decision is irrelevant if you don't have a goal. But what about in the or, sense, or some type of shared value? What What's about in that? the sense, like, so one thing that I take from it is a little bit different view of it is like, you could have a goal and a and a direction in mind, but but then you can shift, you can pivot, right, and change because the data showed you something else. Like in my example, like we found additional questions to ask, and that actually changed the direction that we took the rest of that uh, project that we were working on. You know, because originally the the customer comes in and says well, here's all my data. And I'm pretty sure this is the question I'm trying to answer. You know, who's my top salesman or whatever. And and then you start crunching the data and you say, actually, that's, that's not the most interesting question that you could ask, right? Based on what we see in your data, there's actually more interesting questions you should ask and you get more value out of it, right? Yeah. But the, to the organization, I mean, they always have a goal, right? You're data is helping to make a decision, uh, you know, to, to reach that goal, but they should always have a goal in mind. Otherwise, what's the point of doing this? You know, I mean, granted, there's some like, let's just see what we find out, you know, knowledge discovery would be the goal then, uh, in which case, yeah, it doesn't really matter how you attack it. Just try to learn something. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I mean, I think, yeah, I think it's side of things. Go ahead, Rob. Well, I, I had a really hard time getting a, into chapter one because I'm just so used to trench warfare and dealing with you know developers and CN admins and stuff. But all the executive talk and like the company as a fiefdom just put me to sleep. <laughs> I mean, there wasn't a lot of content in chapter one. I mean, it was basically just a, an intro type thing. It was really well, there just to define a couple of, of uh, you know, key points and sort of put it in perspective, I think. 
I think there is a lot of like touchy feely big corporate stuff and even kind of in the whole section that we read though for me as a developer at my generally my development has happened in smaller companies not big giant corporate monolithic things so this is a bit more of a different world for me you know like i've, I've worked with some of the technology practices but the yeah the idea of corporate fiefdoms and all of that was a bit too much for me as well I, I like your opinion. <laughs> yeah, I like your opinion. I, su I support you, Rob. Um, I second your opinion. I would like whoa, to subscribe to your newsletter. Developer and DBA agree. Yeah. Wait, if, well... If anybody about... else out there has questions, too, I guess we should open that up, too. You can raise your hand or type it in the chat. You know, feel free so to throw something of, out there. The thing about, you know, BI, which is different than a lot, is that the ultimate customer is the CEO. And so you do interact at a higher level than you you know than you would otherwise get to doing other things in IT. So right, it's not it's not consumer focused. Right. Right. Not always, right. So so you and the thing is the C the CEO might never use any other application. Like he you know the company might make flight reservations, but the CEO doesn't make a flight reservation. He doesn't care, right? He has he tells somebody, make a reservation for me, right? He he'll never use another application of the whole company except the BI app. So it just tends to get you into the corporate structure more than than maybe technologists are comfortable doing. Do you think there's a scenario where you can like the thing that comes to my mind there is you're leaning too heavily on your BI. Like, just trust the machines. Just trust the machines, right? <laughs> like, all I use is this tool, and whatever it says is is right. Like, do you think there's any balance there that you have to be wary of? Well, I think Microsoft is guilty of that. Like, I've talked to people in the evangelism team where I'm like, hey, we can put your product in front of 2,000 people if we do it this way. And I've had them basically say, my metrics that bubble up to the decision makers don't incentivize me to do that. And you're like, well, if your goal is to sell product, then you've got to break away from the metrics and look at, you know, make autonomous decisions. But really, how do you, how do you know when you're in that situation? Case structure, the structure, what's that? How do you know when you're in that situation? Like, is there a point at which you're using? The BI tool, and there's something you should look for and say, "Oh, I need to step away and make an autonomous decision." Like I imagine you use them in harmony. You can use both tools, but you have to know when you're leaning too heavily on one or the other. Yeah, I don't know. How do you know? Like I'm not really a management consultant, but I do know that it, you guys know. Like when you write a new application for a company, you know, we developers are terrible at making a bad process good. But we are very good at making a good manual process far, far better, right? But you can't, software isn't the cure-all for everything, right? If you have a terrible, terrible process with terrible employees and terrible leaders and you introduce software, you're basically going to get a really efficient, terrible system. You're going to be really good at being terrible, right? But but if you have a good process that you want to make more efficient, then software does a great job. Yeah, it just makes you better at whatever you do. So if you're really if you're already terrible, you're going to get be more terrible, right? Let me ask a follow up question there. Um, have you ever seen anyone Ike make a decision based off of the key performance indicators. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it seems like it's just there as information just to give them a warm fuzzy. Have you seen somebody say, oh look, that light is orange instead of green. I'm going to do something different now for my long-term strategy. That's a good question. No, I don't see that too often, but what do I, what I do see so they make their decision based on data in Excel, right? They, like, I think they analyze it in Excel and they look at it and then they come to a conclusion. 
and then they use the KPIs not so much to make a decision but to warn everybody what the inevitable is right like hey everybody look at the dashboard I'm looking at if you see these numbers go low I'm gonna yell <laughs> and, and so everybody's looking at the gauge to just kind of get all on the same page right like yelling starts when that letter goes red <laughs> and, um, yeah yeah so so it's like it's almost like the definition of business intelligence that he's defined here doesn't quite jive with KPIs you know like what he's trying to do is get useful information to make the appropriate decision whereas KPIs are not necessarily the right thing to be looking at you know I mean they give somebody a happy feeling but they don't necessarily determine long-term strategy well I don't know about long-term strategy but it I think it's mostly used as a communication tool and it's used to promote action so it might not be a long-term strategy but it could be a short-term strategy like when I see our return rate go through the roof in Florida I call that manager and find out what's going on there I mean they definitely make decisions like that what about going back to this whole yeah but he said um, that KPIs are used in the higher echelons and at the higher echelons are more focused on long-term strategy so I, I don't know I kind of felt like that was a disconnect in what he was saying yeah I mean the famous example that they use is British Airways where the guy from BA who took over the company was borderline bankrupt I mean losing money for decade and uh, years and years and you know no hope and they were focused on money so much that he decided that he wanted to analyze what a leading indicator for revenue was and he looked at all these different numbers and he figured out that delayed flights were the number one problem his customers had and that if he lost a customer he lost them because of delayed and canceled flights so he created a dashboard to show him delayed flights where he could drill into it and see it um, by region and airport and and even by manager and then that counter was on his desk and then he put that counter all over British Airways like he put it on the reservation desk and the executive team and directors and marketing and everybody had this counter and he embedded it like in all their applications and it got to a point where like if San Francisco canceled all the flights that day and they had a bunch of delayed flights that the CEO of British Airways would call the gate and say what's going on there at that gate like why are you guys delaying flights and by doing that after about a year their delayed flights like dropped I don't know I can't give you exact numbers but it was an enormous enormous improvement on delayed flight and then they saw revenue skyrocket after that and, and it kind of after that became kind of a more financially stable company so um, I don't know how true that is. I wasn't working for British Airways, and I've only heard that story a couple of times apocryphally. So, but it, in any case, it is a very good example of how BI can be, can work at a high level, at a higher level. Doesn't that go back to this idea of like? I mean, it sounds like to me that in order to get accurate KPIs, you need to know what question to ask. It goes back to this idea of like the the data. The, the BI part of it starts with figuring out what the right question is to ask and maybe you have some in mind and then maybe you discover some along the way and then based on those questions you can you can formulate KPIs that track the answer to that question that you care about, right? Yeah, I think so. I think that's accurate. Since we're still keeping this kind of meta conversation, you know, in tune with the first five chapters, one of the things I've always struggled with with BI is that you know in the DBA world everything I have is measured, you know query cost that's measured, IOPS that's measured, you know transactions per second everything is measured. And I can say with such a certainty, you know when a change happens or that something has improved, I've always kind of felt uncomfortable with all the interpreted side of things with the BI world. What do you guys think of that assessment? That's interesting. Um, I really think that BI, that BI succeeds when the business is equipped for it to succeed. Like I almost think that BI is 
irrelevant what technology you use. Like it doesn't matter if you use Tableau or MicroStrategy or Microsoft Tools or Excel or reporting services or you know Telerik controls or whatever you want to use. It almost doesn't matter as long as um, the business is equipped to react and to use the tools and, and they know what they want. And kind of what makes or breaks the whole thing is um, good data analysts and good executive sponsor. So to your point, like when you're looking at marketing data, the marketers have it down to a science. Like they, they know when they send out a mailer how much that improved sales. And they'll use BI to analyze the effectiveness of their campaigns and where they're getting their business from. And it's, it is an exact science to those guys. But you'll go to other executives who might not be as equipped for things like that. And, and yeah, it does kind of seem like maybe it's more of a shot in the dark. So then the, the kind of mantra of, if, you know, if you think a good developer is expensive, wait until you hire a bad one. Does the same apply to the VR world in terms of the analysts? Like if you think a good analyst is expensive, wait until you hire you know, a bad one and start just churning your wheels. Yeah, and you know what? In my opinion, analysts are kind of underpaid. Like, like I see really, really good analysts who are really, really phenomenal at their work, and they make half what the BI architect makes. Why do you think that is? Is you that think, wow? That guy like works just as hard. Is that is maybe? That? Is that maybe because they're not selling themselves correctly, or is that because the businesses undervalue that role? I think it's because MBAs are a dime a dozen right now. Like there's so many schools churning out MBAs. I really do think they're overpopulated. Like mm -hmm. there's just way too many business schools and there's no regulation and you can get an MBA from 500 different schools but only people only know about six really good MBA schools, right? And then the rest, who knows if they're good or not. And you're just competing with a lot so it drives the salaries down for those guys. I mean, and, it, and I don't know why they don't pay the really good ones like they should, but a really good data analyst or business analyst, they're like incredibly brilliant, just so smart. So Ike, would you hire someone with an MBA or someone with an economics degree? <laughs> I don't know. I, I never give it any thought. I, you know. <laughs> I don't I know if the art degree. history, I think, art history or political science, I prefer. That. <laughs> I, I don't know. That's too tough. I mean, we know developers I, who are amazing who have like philosophy degrees. I, honestly, in my opinion, I don't even think it matters. I mean, I don't know as well from the database world, but from a developer world. In fact, I was responding to an email to somebody today who asked me kind of a similar question, like how would they market themselves as an effective C sharp developer in the current market and they were thinking about getting certifications, you know, MCSDs and all that stuff. And I said, honestly, that, that stuff to me doesn't matter. It's how do you think and, and how do you go about, you know, building software? And anybody can do that if they have the right mindset and they, you know, their brain works the right way, regardless of what degree or credentials they have after their name. Some of the best developers I've ever worked with, like, our, like I said, have been, you know, art degree or no degree and just self-taught hackers that, you know, they just get it. So I assume the same yeah. thing applies to the DBA world and the, the BI world. If you get it and you study it and you have a passion for it, you're probably going to be good at it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. As, so someone, as someone with no degree and no certifications, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right, Rob? That is correct. Well, Rob, it, Rob, in your case, I would, I would never hire you no matter what. <laughs> it's just nothing that would convince me. I dropped out of college with like six hours left in my degree, much to the anger of my parents. Six I hours, like really? Stuff. Yeah, it's really bad. I like this definition of business intelligence right here on the screen. It says, business intelligence is the delivery of accurate, useful information to the appropriate decision makers within the necessary time frame to support effective decision making. And just shorthand for saying, you know, we deliver the right data to the right person at the right time. And yeah, I, re I really think that if you focus your BI efforts on that goal 
and you drive it from that direction and not from the technology direction, that you have a much greater chance of being successful. All right, on to chapter two. <laughs> chapter two. Excellent yeah. work. <laughs> okay, so he's talking about data mining. Stop me if you guys want to talk about any of this stuff. Where um, I don't really like it when he spent so much time talking about maximum miniatures and yeah. the use case. I got kind of bored in that part. He just wants you to understand it. But if you if you go back, uh, sorry, to the end of chapter two, I think it was in like twenty one or something. Yeah, right there. Oop, forward one. So the little picture. Yeah, there you go. Um, one of the things that I noticed, like the set of incoming data, seems to be limited to a Microsoft stack. <laughs> and I know that you can get XML files or comma separated files from you know pretty much any system, but like. Like, why not another database? Why isn't there, you know, accounting system using, you know, MySQL or Postgres or, so, you know, something like that? It, it felt like in a big organization, you never have just one database, you know, throughout the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, good point. Um, probably it's because he wanted to limit setup <laughs> on the workstations. Right. Yeah, yeah, but I, I would like to, you know, you know, have a chapter. If he's talking about ETLing from other sources, it would be good to have at least some strategies for ETLing from other databases. At least the other big two, right? Postgres and Oracle. Yeah. Well, I don't know if there's two. I mean, yeah, I guess. I don't, I don't know I what wanted... the numbers are, but. I want to disagree with you because, you know, it's a Microsoft book. It should have a focus. But this book is so huge. I mean, I have a paper copy right next to me. Like, it is so huge that, I mean, I, I can't really see why he shouldn't. Yeah. Yeah, well, part of the reason why it's so huge, I think it's Chapter 5, but we'll get there in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Oh. Yeah, you, okay, well, hang on. I've got, okay, so right now we're in Chapter 3 where... He introduces um, a lot of the vocabulary that you guys were talking about, and um, yeah. and this is a good chapter. This I really like this chapter. This was a good setup chapter. I have no problems with it. It's you know, good stuff. Yeah. So he talks about fact tables and dimensions. And the way I like to think about it is, facts are numbers, and dimensions are words, usually. So a fact is the number that you want to see in a cell, and a dimension is the way you want to see it or the way you want to slice it. So when people say, I want to see sales by product or sales by employee by region or sales by month, quarter, and year, what the sales is the fact. Sales amount, sales cost, sales profit, those are the facts. And all the buy stuff, those are the dimensions. By date, by month, by region, by employee, by customer, by, by product category, those are all the dimensions. So if you extrapolate that out. Um, yeah, I didn't really like his definition. I'm sitting here thinking I knew Sorry, I should just I am Ike instead of reading this whole chapter. <laughs> <laughs> so if you ext extrapolate that out, like I'm thinking of how would you name the dimensions like so the fact is the table name and the dimensions are the column names but is it like can you say that the name of the table is the question you're trying to answer or is it the answer no no the dimensions are the sorry the they're fact. like the aspect right so like time date and time you know sure like that that's a dimension sure. right and it could have not the column names because that would be like year month you know whatever um so it's yeah, it's like it's like it's a related um, well, but aspect. Couldn't, couldn't you say in that in the in the fact? So so yeah, so year, month, day, right? So that those are the dimensions you could slice that data on. So no, 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 no. That is a dimension. Time. 
That's what I, that's what I'm trying to say. That's a a single dimension. See, this is where the difference in, in vocabulary comes in because I've always thought of dimensions as because because you could slice by year or by month or by day or by year month day like any combination of those, right? If yeah, if, that's the range on your dimension. Yes. All right. So there's a difference in vocabulary. I always thought of dimensions as correlating to, to a columns in a table, and they're the options on how you can slice a fact, which is the table name. A dimension is like just basically a table describing one aspect of a measure. So one of those aspects is time. Another of those aspects is probably you know which product it is, etc. It's the reference information about a fact. Hey, um, I had a question actually about that. The um, the 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 cube like diagram. Are any of the visualizations for um, reporting this information? Do they utilize cubes in the visualization? Um, not really. Yeah. Uh, usually, all BI data comes out in some type of chart, graph, or tabular format, or maybe over a map. Right. So, but not really. really, they. Analysts love pivot tables, and you guys have played with pivot tables in Excel, so you're going to see just a ton of pivot tables. Um, yeah, but you know they like bar charts and spark lines and and heat maps and things like that. It's like buzzword overload right there. <laughs> Uh, well, those are the actual names of the things that you can add to the report or the dashboard too. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then here's what Brad was talking about with the star schema, and it kind of looks like a star there, doesn't it, with five points? Um, it's very flat. You're actually seeing the entire data model. There are no other tables that it's hiding over in the background. It's just a very center table and then a whole bunch of thin tables around it. Um, although uh, dimension tables can be very wide, have lots of columns. So you'd have a dimension table, like Scott was saying, um, like dim year is a bad example. You would actually have dim date, and then year would be a column. Yeah, if you go one more, dim one more page, Ike, it'll be one more page, or two, sorry. There you go. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so dim year. I'm not sure I'd call it dim year where he has month ID here. But like in a date dimension, you'll see everything related to a date that you would want to see. Um, so how are, so here's one thing that I've struggled with in the past trying to create these star schemas is deciding how because you're loading the data from transactional data and and you know transforming it to fit into the star schema and then making the decision on at what level of detail to break the data up. Like you could make the call and say, well, the, the lowest level of granularity is going to be the year or the quarter or the month or the day or the hour or the minute or the, like you could just keep going. Right. So, and I feel like if you make the wrong decision up front, it's a pain because you have to go back and retransform if you need to go to a lower level of granularity. But I feel like there's a trade-off. Like I don't want to go all the way to the second because no one will probably ever need that, but like, how do you make those decisions? Well, that's a great question. And maybe out of the scope of the first part of the reading, but sure. yeah, BI changes aren't as easy as we would like them to be. And it's kind of the reason why he talks about it later in chapter four when he talks about two semantic models. One of the drivers behind this, the difference between multi-dimensional models and the new tabular model is that tabular models are they're much easier to implement. It's much easier to get a tabular model changed or even in the field so it can be used. Where multi-dimensional models it just seems to take a lot longer. Um, maybe by an order of magnitude longer. I had to read a lot of chapter four just on faith and hope that, you know, it'll be more clear later. Yeah, again, yeah, he's introducing vocabulary like this thing where he talks about Rolap and Molap and Holap. <laughs> yeah. I, I thought that 
that sort of belonged, but the caching discussion, that was one of the areas I thought was like, what in the heck, way too deep, too early. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, that caching discussion isn't isn't super deep because what's did... IIS, Ike? No, no, no. He's not talking about IIS. Yeah, he He's is. Not... It's right there on your screen. You Which... highlighted it. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> no, no. No, he's I mean, using IIS to relate an example. He's not I, talking about IIS caching. He's saying the reason why we have cubes is so that we can cache similar to the way IIS caches. And that's so, all he needed to say. The fact that it went on for four pages is the part I have a problem with. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah, the problem is... He should have said, we have analysis services so that when you want an aggregate, we don't have to calculate it. We can keep it in cache, and it'll be faster. Right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That would have been a great summary. Like three sentences, okay, that's enough about caching. Let's move on, rather yeah. than like diving into this. Yeah, yeah. XML, yeah. I can see that. Um, and then uh, he talks about the tabular model, and we're going to build these things coming up here, but the tabular model is something that they introduced in SQL 2008 in a product called Power Pivot, and it was just a very, very fast way to analyze a lot of data in memory, and it worked so well, but the problem was when you put something in Power Pivot, it's basically in Excel, and when it's in Excel, it's out of IT's control. So a lot of people were using Power Pivot, but they were doing their calculations differently, or they were using bad data. And there was this request that said, hey, let's get this Power Pivot data that, that is spread in the wild like crazy, but let's put it under IT control. And so what they did was they took the Power Pivot engine that was already in Excel, and they moved it to the SQL Server Analysis Services engine, and they said, now you can import your Power Pivot models into SQL Server and control it there and then give your users access to it remotely so that they can have a pivot table and just use SQL Server as the engine. And the idea behind that is tabular structures are held in memory and servers have more memory than workstations and that memory can be shared with a lot of other users, right? So we have these big, beefy servers. We have a lot of memory. We have these power pivot models that IT is controlling the definitions of the calculations. It's, they're controlling the tables and the columns that exist and their name, names and things like that. And now business users can build pivot tables off of you know, better hardware. It's faster. And now we have a common nomenclature you know, across the organization. So that's... Those are the kind of things that drove that. And, and the reason why it was necessary is because of how difficult and how lengthy multidimensional projects were and how prone they were to failure. You know, you know anything in software development, the longer a project takes before users use it, the higher risk that thing will succeed or not. And, and so we, if we can cut down development time and get in front of the user as quick as possible, we have a much higher success rate. And I think that's the other thing that drove Tabular. Good summary. Yep. <laughs> um, so we got about 12 minutes till one or so. Oh, uh, so let's just briefly talk about chapter five. I know why you guys oh, didn't like yeah. it. <laughs> What's that? This oh, should have been cut out of the book. Yes. Yeah. Let's talk about why this book is so big. This you're looking at it. It's chapter five. I mean, like, how much? How many pages is that? Like, starts on sixty, ends on eighty-six. So twenty-five basic pages here, describing where the buttons are <laughs> in the tools. Yeah. I mean. Like that sort of stuff, that's information that's easily found online. There are walkthroughs, there are tutorials. It would be much better, you know, digested in that model anyway. You should have just put a link, said go to it at the beginning of the next chapter. 
is yeah. my opinion. Yeah. Um, well, here's the thing. Here's why it's here. Um, you three love Visual Studio and are in it, you know, regularly for a lot of different projects. Maybe Rob not so much, but um, you know, he wrote this for DBAs who might be switching, and DBAs may have never opened Visual Studio before. Well, are we talking about Visual Studio, SSDT, or SSMS? Which so, are all Visual Studio, but with different labels. And I think, if anything, I think Chapter 5 kind of highlights how silly the IDE uh, story is between the, all, these, all these products. How, how they just kind of, um, I guess, kind of bastardized versions of Visual Studio. Yeah, um, I don't know. I, I don't know if I agree with you, Rob. I, That's cool. I I uh, I like the tooling. I like the Microsoft tooling, but um, it might be because I've been using it for so long that I'm just comfortable with it. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Let me rephrase it. Why isn't it all Visual Studio with different project types? Well, in a sense, that is what SSDT is, is Visual Studio with different project types. I mean, it's a So if I install Visual Studio, I get that? If you install Visual Studio and SQL Server, you get it, but you, you don't have to leave Visual Studio. Yeah, but you have to install, there, it's called SSDT, it's the data tools. So you don't have to install SQL Server, you can just install SSDT um, for Visual Studio 2012. And uh, it's just one of the downloads here. So if you, where is it here? Um, there was a get it link in the up left, uh, Mike. Oh, was there? Was there? OK. Yeah, get it. Yeah. So you can get the latest version of SQL Server data tools for Visual Studio 2012. and. And it's just Visual Studio. Like you, you don't leave the tool or start it differently. And maybe the story's improved since I used it, but I hated like I would be using Visual Studio 2012 for coding, but then I'd have to go to Visual Studio 2010 for you know SQLy stuff, you know for uh, bids. And then there's Management Studio, which is like Visual Studio, but it doesn't have a, you know a very good plugin story. Like I've just always been kind of frustrated by that lack of communication between the departments and kind of having one like really nice unified IDE. No, I agree completely. Historically, it's been a pain in the ass. <laughs> okay, um, I guess I'm alone. I feel better now. Okay, good. <laughs> no, you yourself admit, Ike. You yourself admit, Ike, that um, like I'm using Visual Studio 2012 for everything, but then prior to this last release, I had to go back to 2010 to do any sort of reporting. They were yeah. always running behind. And then in order to do database development inside of Visual Studio, I had to download all these various plugins and extensions that didn't quite work well together, or I had to shell out into another tool. That's what Rob's talking about, and it's totally true. It's a painful, oh, confusing yeah. process unless you've grown up in the process as we have. No, that you're right. Okay, now I understand, Rob. Now I understand, and you are totally right. That is very, very painful, and and I still find that painful because, you know, what happens in SSIS is if you open it with the wrong tool, you upgrade it, and and you're like, whoa, uh, I didn't mean to do that. I got to use that, you know, in the on the 2005 server. Um, in the Visual Studio world, they finally made it. I mean, this last uh, time, 2012, they finally made it so that you can open up solutions in prior versions without, you know, upgrading or changing the solution. You know, so like I can open up a 2012 solution in a 2010 SP1 Visual Studio and vice versa. Right? They finally did that. I mean, after well. 12 years, basically, it's, you know, started in 2000, Visual Studio. So it took them a long time to realize that that was a pain point. Yeah. Hey, so we've got only a few minutes left. Do you guys want to talk about something cool that you've learned this last month or that you think is cool? 
So I've got something. It's not um, <clears throat> not necessarily something I learned last month, but I think it's kind of relevant to uh, what we were kind of talking about in the first couple of chapters of BI. It's a little bit of an older um, TED talk by a guy named Gary Flake. Uh, maybe you can just Google it. It's it's called uh, Pivot. He's got to talk about this pivot control, which was this, yeah, which was the Silverlight thing. Uh, that's probably going to start auto playing, so you might want to pause it. It was a Silverlight thing that they built a while ago. This is a couple years old, but the interesting thing wasn't so much the control. It kind of goes back to this thing I was talking about where it was like, by by using the control to look at the data from a high level view and being able to slice the data on these different, effectively these different dimensions, um, they were able to find questions to ask that they didn't even know would have existed in the data. So it's definitely worth a, a watch. It's pretty interesting. The, the control itself, I don't think ever made it out of Microsoft Labs. So I don't know if it's out in the wild or if it's dead or what happened with it, but just conceptually, it's kind of an interesting talk to to watch. And I don't think it's that long. I think it's like five or 10 minutes. Oh, cool. Does anybody else have something? Uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of like these small, like hyper-focused 50 to 100 page books. And I was really pleased to find, except I read these on like Redis and there's uh, some hotspots and Postgres and stuff too. And I just recently found one called the Little React book by the, for the, uh, the NoSQL database React which uh, has also has a really cool uh, .NET driver uh, built and maintained by Jeremiah Peshka, who's a SQL Server MVP. And uh, I was just like finding these little books that are free, work on all platforms, and are just a nice change of pace reading from you know, a monster book like what we have. It's a R. Uh, R-I-A-K. Yeah. R-I-A-K. There we go. Thanks. LittleReactBook.com. There we go. Nice. Okay, I'll put these links on the website. I just find these um, fun little reads. Yeah, that's cool. What about you, Scott? You have something? Yeah, not really. Um, <laughs> I, uh, you know, didn't really know I had to do that. But um, the uh, speaking of TED talks, um, there's a great one on uh, data visualization, which is many years old, um, which. Uh, there's one by like McCann, that one, but then that's not the one I'm talking about. I'm talking about the one that was like three down. It was humanity. Um, visualizing our human. Is that the one? I think that's the one. No, no, no. I'm sorry. Go, go back. It was the second link. Yeah. Yeah, this one. Yeah. yeah. That, this is amazing. The, the talking about like, census data and how the world is changing, looking at it by plotting basically, you know, three-dimensional, yeah, it's just, it's, it's just amazing stuff. I think this is probably the most popular yeah, a great... TED Talk of all time. This is definitely the TED Talk that made me sit down and watch all the rest of the TED Talks. <laughs> like, I watched this and I was like, oh my god, what am I missing? I need to watch all the rest of these. Things. Yeah. yeah. I did that and then I watched like three or four more. I was like, oh, they're not as good as that first one. Maybe I should stop. <laughs> there are a lot of good ones, but you got to dig through. There, there are a lot of good ones. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. yeah. How about you, Mike? Yeah, I have something. Um, it's... Uh... It's something that we learned in the architecture group. It's called SQL Sharp. This guy's like a stay-at-home dad, uh, which, you know, I'm not, I think that's great that he is, but this is just kind of how he makes his money. And he makes this tool called SQL Sharp, and it's just a bunch of CLR functions that he's made really fast that you could just download the CLR function, and you can get like regex and a bunch of math stuff and like he loves Twitter, so he's got like all these CLR functions to pull Twitter into SQL. And I don't know, like, like there's like 200 functions in here all written in the CLR, and a lot of it is stuff that I've wanted. I've wanted um, SQL to have, and it just doesn't have. And then he sells it like super cheap too. Mm -hmm. I've used this before and really like it. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, I actually have one other question, but do we want to go over, like, uh, you, I think you already mentioned what we're reading next time, right? Part two, and that looks like quite a few pages. Is that right? 323. Yeah, we're not even on 100 yet. That's like 223 pages. Is that right? 
the, all of part two right? is two. Um, two hundred and twenty-three, yeah, or two hundred and thirty-three. I'm sorry, two hundred thirty-three. And that's just um, chapters six, seven, and eight. Yeah. Is two hundred pages. Yeah. Um, we can lower it down a bit. Do you want to just do six and seven? Yeah. Yeah. Chapter eight is pretty standalone anyway. It's integration services. That could yeah, be okay. Seven too. Seven is integration services. Oh too. yeah, you're right. I think these things go pretty fast. You just have to read it in front of a computer. Yeah, there are a lot of pictures. That might be all right. Yeah, I think it, it's going to go pretty fast for us. Plus, many of us have used integration services before, and if you haven't, you know, you can just call me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I actually had one other question about um, last time's reading. Yeah. So, Ike, you had mentioned like a month ago or something, or no, it's like a couple weeks ago, I guess. You were preparing for a class, and you had said the the Microsoft BI stack is really difficult to get set up correctly. Um, yeah. Looking at the part five or chapter five, it didn't seem that bad. But I have a running SQL Server already. So, what what part of the stack setup is the most difficult? What should we watch out for as we're getting going on on the, these next chapters? Well, it's a really complicated answer. Uh, no, it isn't. It's SharePoint. So, <laughs> it, anything related to SharePoint is just so difficult to fight with. Gotcha. And we don't actually need that for any of the stuff we're doing in this book, do we? Uh, I think we might. Um, but we can use my SharePoint server on Azure. It's that I've got on a VC if you'd like. Um, okay. Might have to post that out to the group. Okay, yeah. Well, that answers. I mean, SharePoint, enough said. I didn't realize that you had to set it up. Oh. Yeah, okay. I had to mute myself to stop the vomiting from coming yeah, through. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, SharePoint Actually, I... is used for like, Excel services and um, it can be used with reporting services, and this thing right here, Power View, can use SharePoint. It doesn't have to, but um, it can. And so um, we can kind of skip the SharePoint stuff, but like for me, teaching a BI class, I kind of have to cover it. Right. Uh, I have one other question, uh, slightly related. So the other platforms, like, OK. I know that probably Oracle has a BI stack. Yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely positive they do. I never want to look at it, but I'm sure they have one. Yeah, um, sure. But if if you're, you know, like uh, Brad was saying earlier, you know, he doesn't do a lot of, um, you know, large enterprise-y type development. You know, there's a lot of small projects, and a lot of small project developers are using things like, you know, MySQL or NoSQL even. So. If the data is being held in there, if the OLTP type data is being held there, um, what sort of business intelligence stack would they use? If the data is in OLTP? If the data is in like a MySQL store or a NoSQL store, you know, some like really small, like open source y, you know, database, you know what I'm talking about? So like everything's going to have a driver for it, whether you're, like I'm using a single Postgres or if I'm using like Redshift, which is comprised of a whole lot of uh, Postgres servers. You have to use your language's specific driver or your Excel plugin. So um, I'm not sure it, that that answered my question. So I think what I heard so, the, what I heard the answer to, was if you use that. I, sorry, I think what I heard the answer was that you're trying to pump. You say pump the data into Excel. Rob? Yeah, is that, I mean, you're trying to get, so you do all the processing on whatever platform and then you need to get it out, right? Scott, you need to get it out for consumption? Yeah, get, get, get it into an analysis, cons yeah, exactly, into a data mart and, and exactly. So, so I, I, was, I was sort of asking, you know, if I'm not a Microsoft developer and I'm not using SQL Server for my OLTP, what do I use for my analysis? Well, um, the market leaders right now are um, Tableau, ClickTech, Microsoft can still use that data, by the way. Microsoft uses that data great. And MicroStrategy, those are the big four players in the BI space right now. 
So you're saying that we could take, uh, let's say we have a Mongo database. If we wrote a, a transform, some sort of ETL using the Mongo drivers, we could dump it into analysis services? Yeah, you can. Um, you know, you're going to be better off um, using, you know, putting it into a Microsoft data warehouse, like a SQL Server database. But, you know, you're going to have to put it somewhere anyway. You're not going to query it off of Mongo. It's got to go oh, to sure. some database anyway. Yeah. Okay. That's that's what I was that's what I was sort of asking. So, Tableau. Does anybody have any experience with Tableau Quick Click Tech or MicroStrategy? Um, a little bit with Tableau. Yeah, a little bit. But Dave Sumlin is a Tableau administrator, and we know him. We can bring him in as a guest. Yeah, that might be interesting. Get an get an alternative, uh, you know, perspective, alternate perspective. Okay, guys, I got to start my class again, so I've got to go. <laughs> Perfect. See We're guys, at one o'clock. Fun. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, guys. All right, I'll post Bye. this to YouTube too for anybody that wants to watch it later. Okay. Cool. We'll we'll meet next month. All right, guys. All right. See you then. Bye. Bye, everyone.